evening, everyone, and welcome to the American Psychiatric Association's webinar on advancing the use of telehealth through advocacy and education. I'm Dr. Bob Batterson, and I'm the Section Chief of Child Psychiatry at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm also one of the past speakers to the assembly, and I happen to be today's moderator. We will be recording this webinar to post on the APA website along with the slides so that the participants will be able to share this important information with their colleagues. This is APA's second webinar focused on telehealth since the United States Department of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency on January 31st due to COVID-19. We held one in March to help members quickly transition their practices given the many legal and regulatory changes that occurred after this public health emergency was declared. Following up on the first webinar, APA surveyed its membership to understand the impact of changing to virtual care in the time of physical distancing. We found that before the pandemic, 62% of the almost 600 respondents reported seeing none of their patients via telehealth. By mid-April, 86% of respondents were seeing nearly all of their patients via telehealth with high rates of patient satisfaction. I've also personally used telehealth for about the past six to eight years, um, but like many members of the APA, most of my telehealth experience had been with patients who were in another clinic in a remote location. Um, seeing people in their home was of course uh, a change that had to be made uh, due to the physical distancing and other things that were needed even at remote clinics. And so this has been quite an experience for me and I personally have also been seeing about 80 to 90% of my patients via telehealth now. Most are seen on a virtual platform called Microsoft Teams and we do see some of our patients uh, in person but a, a very small number indeed. I would also mention that a number of our patients are having struggles with their internet service such that we are doing some telephonic care in about 20% of our patients. The primary concern we learned from the survey though is that there are challenges with implementing telehealth technology into practice. Some patients need help in adjusting to the platforms and I have definitely experienced that myself and that is why today's webinar will be focused on offering tips for delivering virtual care. Also, many of us were not trained in residency to do this because it was certainly not an option until uh, a, a later period in time than when many of us were in training. Because of the current public health crisis, we've learned that having access to telephone only telehealth is essential in healthcare delivery as a tool for patients, and especially for those who lack broadband or the capability to use video conferencing software. It is especially an issue for older patients at most risk of COVID. Because of the advocacy work of the APA and many others, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and other payers are now covering telephone only care, providing a lifeline to patients who would otherwise not receive care. We know that telehealth improves access to high quality evidence-based effective care for a number of patients and can be used successfully and adopted swiftly. When regulatory hurdles are removed, and that is another issue that we'll be discussing today. Numerous regulatory burdens have been lifted under the public health emergency by the Department of Health and Human Services and its Secretary Alex Azar and a national emergency declaration made by President Trump. This public health emergency declaration must be extended every 90 days. It has been extended once since January 31st and that puts it to set to expire at the end of July. Secretary Azar has very recently announced that he indicates his plan to continue the emergency declaration, but we need to set our advocacy groundwork now to be sure that telehealth regulations that allow us to easily and effectively see our patients are permanently lifted and not unexpectedly stopped. This is vital to ensure the continuity of care for our patients and for the health and safety of patients and healthcare providers. This webinar will underscore the regulatory barriers that have been removed as a result of COVID-19, and we will also focus on tips for delivering care to our patients using telehealth and give practical information on reimbursement and how to advocate for long-term change. I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished panel today. Dr. Jay Shore is the Director of Telemedicine at the University of Colorado Depression Center and Chair of the APA's Telehealth Committee. 
He's focused his career on the use of technology in mental health and will include ongoing development, implementation, and assessment of programs in native, rural, and military settings aimed at improving both quality and access to care. Dr. Shore has helped author over 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, and abstracts focused on clinical and research topics in physician health, telehealth, rural health care, veteran, and native populations. Next, we have Dr. Greg Harris, who is Associate Medical Director for Behavior Health at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, and he's also Chair of APA's Committee on RBRVS Codes and Reimbursement. He's a board-certified adult psychiatrist with a master's in public health and over 20 years of practice as an outpatient psychiatrist in primary care, home care, and office-based settings. We also have with us today Dr. Kiki Kennedy, who works as an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University. In this role, she leads advocacy and training initiatives and supervises psychiatry residents in psychotherapy at the Connecticut Mental Health Center and the Yale Long-Term Psychotherapy Clinic. She's also a member of APA's Council on Advocacy and Government Relations. We will have time for questions after the speaker. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zoom, you will see a Q&A box and you can type your questions in there and we will hope to get to as many of them as we can after our speakers have spoken. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shore. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's nice to be with everyone this this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are and what time you're watching this. Um, so I'm going to uh, discuss uh, both uh, very briefly, give an overview of some of the regulatory changes <clears throat> we've experienced, as well as talk about some of the best practices in terms of uh, conducting clinical uh, video conferencing. I'm uh, uh, I'm the chair, uh, current chair of our APA's Committee on Telepsychiatry. Uh, and so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, th we, I think it, we uh, already mentioned that the APA had uh, conducted recently a survey of uh, psychiatrists' use of telepsychiatry um, since the COVID-19 emergency uh, that occurred really uh, in, in February, end of February and March, uh, we experienced as uh, both a profession but as a country the uh, rapid and almost complete virtualization of our clinical as well as our uh, workplace uh, operations. Um, uh, the survey given uh, to APA members uh, showed that 64% uh, uh, were not using telehealth uh, uh, prior to the emergency. Um, since that time, uh, really a radical shift that uh, 84 percent, between more than 75 percent of their clinical uh, caseloads uh, after, after the emergency occurred. Uh, we've seen uh, a decrease in no-shows, uh, and that was reported in the survey, and I think uh, those of us working in large organizations have also experienced that uh, no-show rate uh, because it's Obviously, when you're treating patients in their home, you you know where uh, where 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 likely they're to be if if they don't uh, immediately appear uh, on the video conferencing. Uh, this re, uh, by the, uh, by the APA survey, um, uh, providers reported high satisfaction rates of their of their patients, and also um, less than 25 percent reported that um, they were only uh, that they use phone uh, only meaning that that over 75 percent were able to use video conferencing had access to uh, the technology um, next slide there have been um, a number of uh, regulatory uh, changes that occurred uh, with the covid emergency declarations and I'm just gonna quickly walk us through some of the major areas and what uh, uh, the overview of the regs uh, prior to COVID and during the uh, COVID emergency. Um, of note, uh, as uh, Dr. Batterson already shared, that uh, 
Uh, many of these changes right now, particularly at the federal level, are linked to the public health emergency declaration, um, which needs to be renewed every uh, 90 days. Um, so if uh, we look at state licensure, prior to uh, the uh, emergency declarations, uh, providers um, needed to hold a license where the patient was located at the time of the clinical uh, encounter over video conferencing. Now there are some exemptions with the federal system, the VA, the DOD, the IHS, um, that allows you uh, to work within the federal system, but outside of that, um, there, uh, there weren't many exemptions and certainly was a barrier uh, for uh, at least continuity to care, if not access to care. And, many areas in terms of the state licensure. During the emergency, many states have now um, created a COVID exemption around licensure, um, but uh, it's certainly not universal. It's on a state uh, by a state basis, and each of the states uh, um, specify what that exemption is. And, and so for some states, it's a broader exemption, during the COVID emergency. Um, other states, it may be specific uh, to a continuity of care or just specific to providing care related to COVID. So um, uh, providers need to be careful about uh, uh, making any assumptions and if they have a patient that's moved out of state that they'd like to continue care for or care for a patient out of state, they need to go, my recommendation is they go to the a website of that state medical board and look up whether the, their circumstances and, um, in which they're gonna care for the patient qualify for these exemptions. Additionally, um, you need to make sure that you understand the site of practice issues. Uh, and those include making sure that your malpractice uh, coverage uh, will be valid for the state and they're aware that uh, you're practicing where your practices are. And also uh, uh, states have uh, specific guidelines, rules and regulations with their state medical boards about the practice of telehealth. They may require additional uh, documentation or other things to meet their standard of care. Um, so again, sort of the three things during the COVID emergency and exemption is uh, ha having a, an exception to your license, um, the, uh, making sure the malpractice is aware, and again, following the local standard of care. Uh, the next uh, set of regulations was um, uh, regulations uh, around the prescription of controlled substances called the Ryan Hate Act. And that act is, is very complicated, uh, but uh, an overview is that it uh, really required an in-person examination prior to prescribing via telehealth uh, uh, a controlled substance. Um, currently, during the COVID emergency, that in-person exam requirement is waived. Um, the anticipation now that once the COVID emergency is over, that that uh, requirement will return. And so, uh, although you may be using the, uh, the waived exam requirement during the emergency, uh, anticipating how to continue to provide care and whether you'll need to do in-person exams for certain patients and, and prescriptions at, after the emergency over, uh, is over is important. Uh, there's certainly been um, some very, very favorable opening up of billing and reimbursement, including, so prior to COVID, of course, there were limits on the types of codes, the types of provider, the location, and the technology. Um, during the COVID uh, uh, emergency, uh, uh, centers for uh, CMS, uh, and, uh, particularly Medicare, and then uh, Medicaid, uh, many of the states have followed this, have uh, uh, added additional codes, additional locations, allowed for the billing of phone uh, visits, and allowed uh, for additional provider types to bill for certain codes. And so right now, in the COVID emergency, uh, the billing is quite uh, favorable uh, for, uh, for uh, billing uh, telepsychiatry activities and, and reimbursement, including those conducted over the phone. Uh, 
The final area that people may have heard about is uh, the, uh, uh, the regulation around uh, uh, telepsychiatry uh, and, uh, in general and particularly for billing and reimbursement with many agencies needing to have HIPAA compliant uh, uh, technology. Um, and uh, you know, there are multiple things to be uh, HIPAA compliant, but certainly it has to do with not only encryption, but also how the technology is used within your organization, within your EHR, and within your clinical workflow. Um, currently, during the emergency, the in enforcement, it, a HIPAA compliance is not waived, but enforcement is at the discretion of the feds, and they have signaled that they are, that the enforcement will be lighter, particularly with providers acting in, in good faith, trying to provide access to care. And so that may mean that if you're using, for example, uh, Zoom as we are today has a HIPAA compliant version and all of a sudden uh, you're in a session and you can't, um, the technology uh, has an issue, uh, you could go to, uh, for example, an iPhone and use your FaceTime. Um, uh, I, I uh, recommend that, uh, that if you have HIPAA compliant technology available, you start with that and use the technology that's not compliant with HIPAA as a secondary backup. Um, so that's a summary, uh, hopefully an overview of some of the major areas of regulatory uh, change. Um, next slide, please. If uh, I, I'm gonna make a few comments in, in, in the next five minutes before I hand it over about sort of the broader issues of best practices. And so uh, there is certainly a concept in the telehealth, telepsychiatry literature and uh, the technology li literature in mental health about the idea of hybrid care. And this idea is that we nowadays, even before COVID, we're interacting with patients both in person, but also in virtual space. Um, of course, with, uh, with telepsychiatry slash uh, uh, narrowly defined as video conferencing, that space is video conferencing, but if you think about the other virtual spaces, we interact with patients, including EHRs, patient portals, um, texting, email, uh, a telephone, uh, mobile phones, uh, web-based platforms, all would be really considered this virtual space. And we hold relationships with patients now, uh, and this is prior to COVID, uh, through sort of uh, an array of platforms. So I, I uh, would have uh, hold my doctor-patient relationships in person, over video, via phone, via secure email with patients. And so uh, certainly in COVID, we've moved predominantly to a virtual space and not uh, holding those relationships in person. But the bottom line principle is that um, both during the COVID emergency and I uh, strongly believe after that we are going to really have a blend of in-person and virtual interactions and all become, um, need to become much better at working with patients across a range of technologies, being able to assess uh, for the individual patient in front of us, what is the most appropriate way to interact with them, um, how to best use the technology, understanding its uh, strengths and weaknesses, um, and during what component of the relationship. So for example, you may end up doing intakes in person, um, doing uh, a mix of in-person and video conferencing follow-ups with patients and using a range of technologies such as web-based platforms and patient portals to support that uh, relationship moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. This, uh, this slide illustrates and is available in a, in a recent article about sort of thinking through uh, some of the main technologies we may use with patients and understanding key considerations, uh, again, their strengths and weaknesses in, in both, uh, both uh, the clinical um, interactions with patients, but also 
how to work with that technology from an administrative standpoint, as well as to operationalize it into our organizations and practices. Uh, and again, the reference there um, gives a availability to sort of a more detailed description to understanding this approach and framework. Next slide, please. Um, I, uh, I think uh, a talk right now about video conferencing would not uh, be complete without at least uh, a comment on, on the Zoom fatigue and best practices in video conferencing. Uh, certainly, uh, and Zoom fatigue really uh, is, uh, the obviously Zoom's a platform, but we're really talking about this uh, concept of uh, fatigue of virtual work and particularly video conferencing. Uh, I personally uh, feel that this is a complex phenomenon and it's not just related to video conferencing, but really related to the moment in time and <laughs> this very unique experience we find ourselves when uh, many, many providers and organizations had to adapt to video conferencing with very little training or implementation time. Often, uh, pr prior to COVID, this would be uh, a several weeks to month long process to learn to use video conferencing and the associated technologies in, one in one's practice. And many people literally within a day were having to uh, move their whole practices, uh, practices into a, a virtual sphere. Um, additionally, I think one can't uh, underestimate, underestimate the stress of being in quarantine and, uh, and being, uh, being uh, physically uh, isolated at home as well as the general stress. So I think that's contributing to what we're seeing, uh, the conversations around it and the fatigue people uh, our, our experiencing, which uh, is very real, and I think uh, that uh, we'll continue to learn about it. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of some uh, brief tips, and uh, uh, more of this can be found at the APA's uh, telepsychiatry toolkit as well, is uh, even now if you find yourself immersed in video conferencing and struggling with it, is making sure that you're that you have adequate training, both in the technical aspects of using the platforms that you're using, but also um, comfort in interacting with patients in particular, but also in professional settings. And, and there is uh, a lot that one can do to increase one's comfort that makes, uh, uh, ma makes it easier uh, to do. Um, certainly ergonomics, things like having a comfortable space to work in, uh, in terms of both uh, uh, lighting, windows, the lighting in which you're uh, being seen over the video conferencing. I have three monitors that I'm using, as people can see, I am not in, in my office, but uh, in, in a location in my basement in, in, in my house, as I, I share um, needs for video conferencing in space with other family members. Uh, I have three monitors. Um, I think two monitors at a minimum um, is required to do video conferencing. Uh, I can't, uh, when I uh, have, am having to use my laptop and moving uh, across programs, I find that uh, uh, frustrating and also uh, time consuming. Making sure one uh, doesn't do eight hours of video conferencing a day, but has some breaks and diversity of scheduling as one is able to. Um, if, you're work, if you're lucky enough to do team-based forms of uh, care, making sure you're uh, maybe having to schedule or set aside uh, team interactions that one may not get over video conferencing that we had in the office. So that sort of water cooler uh, time. Um, making sure that uh, we all have to work a little bit more to connect with one another. Uh, and share experiences uh, with, uh, with our colleagues um, because, uh, uh, because we are not interacting like we normally do in a, in a physical space. And then also uh, if we're either doing a group uh, facilitation either for meetings or treatments, making sure that um, we're participating in groups that are well run, which include an agenda, uh, active participation, uh, you know, a webinar like this where we uh, 
literally may have a hundred or more people. Um, obviously, you cannot facilitate an interaction, but keeping a working group small so you can have that uh, interaction and have the person running the group, making sure that uh, people are being um, are, uh, are are being engaged, uh, particularly by the group leader at the time. Uh, next slide. So um, I'm, I'll conclude my mar remarks and uh, turn it over to my uh, colleagues uh, for the next section, and um, and uh, we'll stay. A little, uh, I'll come back on and stay available for our question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Shore. Um, we appreciate your talk. And next, we have Dr. Greg Harris to discuss reimbursement. Thanks, Dr. Batterson and uh, Dr. Shore. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, as Dr. Batterson uh, mentioned, I'm the chair of the um, uh, Committee on Coding and Reimbursement for APA. And I'm also, I work both in a clinical office um, where I've transitioned to, I'm one of those people who had about 2% of my practice as telehealth and have shifted to 100% telehealth um, during this emergency. And um, I also work for a health plan in Massachusetts. Um, so I have a sort of a, um, a perspective from that. And I'll, I'll sort of cover all of those. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to start out just with a couple of questions as I go through my section on um, what is in the CPT coding manual and give some um, suggestions about coding and reimbursement for uh, telehealth. Um, a couple of questions, and these questions um, come a, a lot in the healthcare um, plan side of things. Um, in that environment, I often hear about telehealth as a thing. Um, as opposed to a site of service or something that might even be broader than a thing. So is it a vendor that provides a service and so that's telehealth or is it something that your provider network and a health plan can provide as Dr. Shore um, discussed where you can do some work in person, face-to-face, -face, some per work um, virtual video audio face-to-face some telephonic and maybe some other things. I think it's important to divide this as we talk about it and think about where we are right now and how, how we get somewhere better than uh, where we came from in, in um, flipping the switch forward post COVID emergency. Um, and the other um, thing is about the, the telephone and, and what that is. And that's, um, I think it's very helpful to divide um, the our discussions about what the telephone is, um, is are we talking about a face-to-face -face service like psychotherapy delivered via the telephone because the person who you're trying to reach doesn't have video audio technology and so you're substituting um, the telephone for video or an in-person visit or are we talking about telephone audio, only an audio visit that is something different from a service um, that we typically would do face to face. So I think about that as the conversation you have helping keep a suicidal patient alive. You might not have a visit next day. You might not send them to the emergency room. They might be suicidal. You, that's a service unto itself. Um, and so I think it's important to be thinking about these concepts. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to start just with CPT um, for uh, maximal dryness uh, to talk about um, codes and, and reimbursement. CPT um, is the current procedural terminology. It's the code book. There are tens of thousands of codes in the book. Um, and it describes what a service is, what's an appendectomy, what's psychotherapy. They have this sort of structure. Um, a lot of psychiatrists don't really look at this book, but I, I think it's instructive and something to be thinking about. And in CPT, there's an appendix called Appendix P. And if you look at the codes, there are 70 out of tens of thousands of codes, there are 70 codes that have a little asterisk next to them. They're listed in Appendix P and they're described as ser services that are face-to-face -face services that can be delivered either in person or through video audio technology. 
And um, according to CPT, you just add modifier 95, and um, that will signify that the code was delivered via video audio technology or with no modifier, it's delivered in person. Either way, it's a face-to-face -face service. Not telephonic um, per CPT, but um, these are kind of what I think of as switch hitting codes. And what's really remarkable to me, not only is the, that there, independent of the, the rules and the regulations that Dr. Shore um, discussed and what CMS does, what Medicaid does, what commercial insurers do and what the states do, um, CPT has this concept that there are certain types of services that could be delivered either way. I personally think this is really an important concept for moving forward. And what's significant about the 70 codes is it's a very restricted um, set of codes, but um, 28 of them are EM codes, which psychiatrists would use, and 16 are psychiatry codes. So most of the psychotherapy codes most of the outpatient E&M codes, and even some facility-based codes, E&M codes, are on this list. So even some inpatient psychiatry codes, for example, could be delivered uh, remote um, through video audio technology per CPT framework. So I think it's really an important framework. Now, many commercial insurers will have a list and say you can use these five codes for telehealth, but that's much more restrictive than the concept in, in CPT. So again, not telephonic, but these are synchronous face-to-face -face services that can be done either video or um, in person. Next slide, please. Oh, and notably on that, um, group therapy is not on the list. Um, I'll talk about some other codes, but um, group psychotherapy is not on that list. So also in CPT are other telehealth services. And so this is the, is telehealth um, just a substitute, a site of service, or is it something broader? And there are two concepts in, in CPT. There's telephonic services, and they, those are divided into physician telephone services and non-physician telephone services. So psychologists, social workers, typically. And the physician codes are an E&M type of a code um, that are a certain number of minutes. It's a service um, separate from a visit. So if you talk to the person for five, 10 minutes on the telephone, but see them within 24 hours, that's a prelude to your E&M and you would incorporate that into the E&M work the next day. Or if you sent them to the emergency room, it would be incorporated into the work in the emergency room. That's a kind of how CPT works. But if you have a conversation, you saw a patient last week and you're seeing them in two weeks and they call you midway between those two sessions and you had a 20 minute visit, that's a service. You might have um, talked about medication side effects, you could have talked about suicide, uh, made a plan, it didn't involve something else. That's an independent service. Most plans don't pay for this. And these, these have been added in the emergency by CMS and many commercial payers. Um, I had a patient who had a suicide attempt on the phone quite frequently, um, maintaining her post, um, her suicide attempt. And after March in Massachusetts with the emergency, suddenly I could bill these codes and the service that I had been providing for months was now a billable service. And it's um, quite a remarkable difference. And then there's non face to face telehealth services. So these are, digital evaluations, interprofessional um, calls, um, store and forward, so digitally stored data. Um, you, know, you could send an image to somebody, they would take a look and they would return that back. Um, some of them may or may not apply to psychiatry, but these are things, again, all of these codes typically not covered um, in a telehealth framework, but are telehealth services within the CPT framework. These are the services never to be done face-to-face -face because of the nature of them. Um, the other services are face-to-face -face services that can go either way. Next slide, please. And then this is just a list of services that, you know, working for a health plan um, that have, as I've been thinking about this and trying to advocate for a post-emergency um, framework, um, Appendix P, the telephone uh, codes, these various codes 
have come up. And then there's the additional services. The, the ones, and this, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the services that have come up in discussion. And what, what's striking to me on this list are group psychotherapy, intensive outpatient programs. Um, you know, what, what I've heard a lot is that um, it's been a lifeline for these programs that uh, without um, a telehealth uh, a facility and in Massachusetts in my plan, uh, we've allowed those services to be rendered via telehealth. Um, uh, partial IOP and um, group therapy. And um, what we're hearing is those programs that have closed down completely. And um, they've really been a lifeline for our patients, our members in the plan. And um, so I think it's, uh, these are things that are not in CPT, um, but are important to sort of say, well, what do we do about the CPT codes? And, and how do we think about some of these other services? Um, that could be delivered and people are actually delivering them in a satisfying way. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this about um, policies because Dr. Shore actually really covered a lot about the um, federal and state um, regulations. But um, what I want to say is that um, when we're thinking about telehealth, there are also um, carrier, insurer, employer, and vendor layers to this. So the, there's what are the federal rules? What are your state rules? What are your insurance company and individuals? So I work for Blue Cross of Mass. What's Blue Cross of Mass's policy for their fully insured members? That's the company's decision, but the, and that's bound typically by state law. But then there are plans that are self-funded and that's an employer, it's typically large employers, and those are typically um, regulated by the ERISA rules, which is a national federal rule, and um, they make different rules. So we have uh, employers who have chosen to have a telehealth benefit, and we have employers who've chosen not to have a telehealth benefit. And during the emergency, everything is changed and scrambled, um, but that was a reality. So. Um, and, and how those employers chose a telehealth benefit um, is highly variable. So we have some employers that picked a vendor and they said, to get telehealth, you have to use American Well or Teladoc or a vendor. And if you want to see your um, provider via telehealth, me, Gregory Harris, well, you're out of luck because your telehealth vendor is this company. And so it's a category, it's a vendor, 100% vendor. So for those employers, they look at telehealth as a thing and they bought the thing and it's done by this vendor. Um, as a provider I, and uh, who sees patients, I look at telehealth more as a site of service. But I think it's actually, it can be both things. So those vendor um, relationships often offer like a very quick access for patients. They can go online and just set up an appointment and um, that's a real convenience. And so that's something I can't offer as an individual provider. But for the patients who I personally see, they're not gonna go to a vendor, I am their doctor. So, you know, it's, it's um, you need to cover both, I think, in the post COVID world. And I think a lot of employers are waking up to this, but I, th I think it's important to remember that we have an employer-based healthcare system. And so the insurers make certain decisions and the employers make certain decisions and those two things interact. And then vendors are out there Se uh, separate. There might be psychiatrists and therapists working for those vendors, but those vendors um, often have the relationships and they they really um, deep ties with the the employers. So it's it's uh, worth thinking about that. And then the next slide, and then I'll um, let Dr. Kennedy um, speak. So this is just a nuts and bolts um, slide, and um, this is a 1500 form, um, and um, there are uh, place of service codes and modifiers um, that you need to think about. And, and every um, carrier has different rules. You have to sort of know these rules. Um, so the place of service, which is the first yellow circle on the left, um, you know, an office visit is an 11 and 02 is telehealth. CMS previously would have, um, you use O2 to signify telehealth, but now they don't want you to use O2 and they want you to use a modifier instead. 
every plan, again, is going to tell you something different. The modifiers go in the location of the second um, circle on this um, uh, screenshot of the 1500 form. And there's a series of modifiers. Uh, the 95 modifier is what CMS is using now. And most, I would say more plans are using the 95 modifier than the GT, but they're relatively interchangeable. So you just need to know, I have several insurers that are my practice. Um, I just have a list of which one uses the 95, which one uses the GT, which one requires the O2, and you just sort of have to sort of know. I mean, one of the things that I would wanna um, advocate for is eliminating the redundancies in the system. So um, CPT has modifier 95, and that to my mind is the simplest um, thing. It's right there in CPT, and adding that to other services that aren't in CPT would be in some ways the simplest. And then um, if we can just go to the next slide, and then I'll finish up. So. So this is back to the, uh, you know, the original uh, questions um, and going particularly to audio, because I, I think audio only, um, I think um, that's a real opportunity right now for advocacy, because I think on the plan side and on the employer side, um, people are realizing the importance of telehealth in a way that they did not realize before. They could talk about it. Um, but it's it's seen as a core thing, and I think that they're seeing that the the field uh, medicine writ large is changing, but um, but mental health is is particularly changing. So my plan went up from uh, a couple of thousand visits in a month of telehealth visits to over two million in three months, and half of those were mental health visits. That's gotten people's attention. Um, that the that mental health fields. Um, really changed on a dime and access is a real uh, worry and a, and a problem. Um, so I think that there'll be a broadening of t the, the concept of telehealth, where when we start getting into telephone, um, that becomes a real issue. I hear, I hear the old um, rumblings going on when I, I talk about how important that is, as to how we manage that, how do we deal with fraud, what, what's a telephone call, it becomes scary in, a, in the health plan um, uh, environment, and particularly where, um, you know, uh, people are losing jobs and, and uh, employers are worried about how they pay for healthcare costs and affordability is becoming an issue. So there's an open-mindedness for telehealth, but then there's a fear on affordability. Um, and I think that um, there's, there's a opportunity there to, um, to, to work with plans um, and alleviate some of their fears about that. And, um, so I'm going to uh, stop my remarks there and pass it on to Dr. Batterson. Dr. Thank Kennedy. you, Greg. And uh, now we have um, Dr. Kiki Kennedy to speak and uh, we'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Batterson. And thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, I'm Kiki Kennedy. And um, as Dr. Batterson had mentioned, I, am, uh, I teach advocacy at Yale. And I'm also the chair of the uh, APA Council on Advocacy and Government Relations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the advocacy work APA has been doing for telehealth, both before the COVID-19 um, and since the pandemic began, and then finish up by uh, asking all of you to help us at the APA advocate for um, greater access to telehealth um, beyond the pandemic. So next slide. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the APA was heavily involved in promoting telehealth efforts on Capitol Hill and with the administration. Most of APA's efforts um, were around lifting the geographic and site of service barriers. However, after Congress passed the Support Act in 2018, which allows patients with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders to receive treatment via telehealth, APA also began to advocate for allowing patients with only mental health disorders to receive treatment via telehealth. The APA lobbied heavily on the CONNECT Act 
which was legislation introduced in both the House and the Senate by a bipartisan coalition of representatives and senators. And the CONNECT Act um, would also expand access to telehealth in a variety of ways. And also APA membership has been involved in supporting all these uh, activities through um, advocacy, whether it's through writing their lawmakers or through our congressional advocacy network, APA, APA members have been working hard um, to connect with their, uh, their lawmakers. Next slide. But as all of you know, uh, COVID-19 has really been a game changer for telehealth and really highlighted the importance of access to telehealth um, for our patients. APA uh, was one of the very first medical associations to call on Congress to enact the authority for HHS to waive existing telehealth restrictions for the COVID-19 health emergency so our patients could receive needed access to care during the pandemic. And then HHS used its waiver authority to allow for video and audio only telehealth to be reimbursed the same as an in-office visit during the health emergency. This experience gained during the health emergency is really the fuel to power our advocacy for long-term change federally because we really want to see telehealth access improve, not just during the pandemic, but beyond. Um, in addition to the federal government, states have their own authorities and ability to act, and there are many ways um, you can advocate at the state level, and I'm going to be talking about that briefly. Um, but let's talk about the federal level. Next slide. So at the federal level, the good news is that Congress has become increasingly aware of the benefits of telehealth. In addition to lobbying on the CONNECT Act, the APA hosted two briefings on tel telehealth, featuring APA members and telehealth experts, one on Capitol Hill as early as February, and one hosted virtually in May. APA has also organized coalition letters, and provided technical assistance in drafting telehealth legislation. And the APA has testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Health Sub Subcommittee twice this year. At both of these hearings, APA witnesses stressed the importance of expanding access to telehealth for the treatment of mental health and substance use disorders. In fact, Dr. Geller testified only last week and it's of note that telehealth was the most prominent topic during that hearing. So now the question is, what do, does Congress and the administration do to extend telehealth beyond the current health emergency, given all that we have learned about the advantages of telehealth? And that's why your personal advocacy is so important. Next slide. So I just want to talk a little bit about the state. Um, at the state level, APA has been strongly involved in advocacy around telehealth, um, uh, even prior to the pandemic. But during our public health emergency, APA's state government relations team has been tracking the temporary changes that states have made, such as requiring payers to cover telemedicine, payment parity with in-person visits, and authorizing telephone-only visits. To advocate in the states, APA and other mental health advocacy organizations sent letters to every governor and insurance commissioner to request that telehealth access be continued for at least one year after this public health emergency ends. And recently, APA led 11 other physician organizations in a letter to all governors and insurance commissioners requesting that they support legislation and regulations permanently requiring all payers to cover telemedicine the same as in-person visits as it relates to payment and access, including, uh, as Dr. Harris noted, audio-only communications. It's important to understand, however, that every state is different. 
Some states are already seeking legislative means by which to maintain increased access to care through telemedicine when it comes to state regulated plans. To assist the, the state district branches with their legislative efforts, APA has undertaken a 50 state survey of telemedicine laws to determine states needs for optimal telemedicine coverage and then has gone ahead and drafted state specific legislative language to address any de deficits. So if your district branch is interested in having telemedicine legislative language drafted, please contact our APA Director of State Government, Government Relations, Erin Philp. You can actually see her email address at the bottom of the slide. Additionally, state government relations teams work with district branches to help craft state specific talking points and assist with letters or testimony to assist with the state legislative practice. So if you're interested in advocating at the state level, I highly encourage you to reach out to both your district branch, but also to APA state government relations team to learn about, about what your state is doing and how you can advance access to telemedicine in your state. Next slide. So what's, what's going forward for, for the APA and for telemedicine? So the APA is going to continue to push for increased access to telehealth at the federal and state levels via legislative and regulatory means as necessary. APA is asking legislators and regulators to support extending the public health emergency and to continue to expand telehealth access even after the emergency ends. In particular, we want to remove the geographic restrictions for mental health in order to allow patients to be seen in their homes. We want to ensure that audio only communications are available for patients who are unable to access video conferencing technology. And we want to make sure that both telehealth and audio only services are covered at the same rate as in-person services. It's vital that APA members contact their representatives in the US House and Senate to ask Congress to pass legislation that guarantees telehealth access will continue after the pandemic ends. Next slide. So how can you do that? Um, basically, APA works really hard, but our advocacy efforts only work if you, as an APA member, get involved and get active. APA staff can do all they can to tell lawmakers about telehealth and its importance, but it's really important that lawmakers hear from their constituents. If they don't, they will not pay attention to the issue. I have to say I'm really pleased to see that there has been a growth in advocacy from our membership during this crisis around telehealth, but it's not enough. We still need to do more. So if you're not already an active advocate, I really want to encourage you to become one. There are three basic ways that you can engage in advocacy with Congress. First, you can write or call your member of con Congress. Second, you can become a member of the Congressional Advocacy Network and actually meet with your member of Congress. And third, you can contribute to APA PAC, APA's Political Action Committee. I'm gonna describe these a little bit. So first of all, for letters, they are really super easy to send through APA's Advocacy Center. In fact, in April, Senators Ernst and Kane were planning to send a letter to CMS to urge that agency to fully reimburse for audio only telephone appointments during the COVID-19 emergency. And I'm really happy to say in just 24 hours, over 230 APA members wrote their senators in support of the letter. And several of our district branches drafted letters for their state's delegation. And some of our district branches even sent their own letters. So you may wonder how effective such form letters can be but I really want to assure you that these letters can make an enormous difference. Congressional staff monitor their mail um, and use that information to help guide their decisions. 
If their office doesn't receive a letter on an issue as important as telehealth, staff tend to assume that that issue is not important to their constituents. So sending letters helps us ensure that Capitol Hill offices pay attention to issues that matter to psychiatry. I also want to encourage you to personalize your letters, which is easy to do in the APA Action Center. And you can choose whether you want to personalize it or not, um, but just really go ahead and send it. So secondly, in addition to writing a letter, you can also join CAN, APA's Congressional Advocacy Network. CAN is APA's grassroots program. Our CAN members work with APA staff to build relationships with their members of Congress by meeting with their members either locally or attending town halls or coffee houses, which many members of Congress hold in their districts or other kinds of events. For example, two of our CAN members, Drs. Nita Bott and Andrew Levy, recently joined a town hall hosted by Congressman Balderson of Ohio. The Congressman had asked to meet with physicians from the community to get a better sense of their needs during this crisis. And so Drs. Bat and Levy joined other specialists to emphasize how important telehealth is in their practice of medicine. Now, I have to say, I do hear from many psychiatrists who do not want to work with their lawmaker, either because of substantially differing political views or conversely, because they assume that their lawmaker is a friend and automatically knows what uh, the constituent wants and doesn't even need to be contacted. But it's really important to understand that in the world of politics, there are seldom permanent en enemies or even lifelong friends. So even if someone with whom you disagree, so even someone with whom you disagree may find it within their political interest to, uh, to take on your issue. Um, and also at any given moment, someone who seems to be friendly, if they're not contacted by you, will not know uh, what you're concerned about and will turn to other priorities and pressing issues that they hear from other constituents. Um, and so even if you feel frustrated with your lawmaker, um, I really hope that you will agree that telehealth is such an important issue. Um, and it's too important for the field of psychiatry and for our patients. And so please, I ask you to reach out to your lawmaker and be laser focused on educating them about uh, the importance of telemedicine. Um, so right now, Congress is a noisy place. Lawmakers are being pulled in many different directions. And we need to make sure our lawmakers know how important telehealth is and that they need to prioritize it. And they will only do that if they hear from their constituents. But remember, I'm not asking you to do this alone. You have the support of APA's Department of Government Relations. They have incredible resources that they can help to prepare you to speak with your member of Congress. DGR staff can walk you through the process of setting up a meeting or answer any other questions that you have before you get started as an advocate. Finally, APA PAC. I really hope you will join our um, political action committee. It is our voice on Capitol Hill and it plays a vital role in APA's advocacy efforts by giving us a seat at the table. Literally, it allows us to walk into a lawmaker's office and explain the importance of whatever issue we are advocating for. And certainly all of us can agree that 2020 is a critical election year. We have an opportunity to shape the next Congress in order to be more responsive to the field of psychiatry and to our patients. But we can only do that if we support um, the APA PAC. I really hope you'll consider making a donation. All too often, mental health and addiction care have been ignored, especially during times of crisis. I think all of you are leaders of the mental health care system, and you can change it by getting involved. There are 538 members of Congress. Every single one of them needs to hear from a psychiatrist to make sure that mental health and addiction care 
are not ignored. Next slide. So you can actually get involved tonight. After you get off this webinar call, I really hope that you will uh, go to um, a, the, a link that should be on your screen or in the chat. And then if you can go to it, psychiatry.org slash telehealth advocacy. It is super easy. You can submit your uh, zip code and then your contact information. As I'd mentioned before, if you want to personalize the letter, go right ahead, then click send. That's all you have to do. So as soon as you're off the call, please go ahead and do that. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so in conclusion, uh, please take action to promote telehealth. Actually, I think you have to go back a slide. There's information on that, I'm sorry. So um, I really hope that you'll take action um, and become an active member of the Congressional Advocacy Network, as well as send a letter to your member of Congress as soon as you get out of this webinar. Um, it's really important um, that the APA build long-term relationships um, with members of Congress and their staff. And please, if you have any questions, if you need support, you can reach out to um, APA to Department of Government Relations. It's a super easy email, advocacy at psych.org. Um, and um, they can help you uh, with many different questions. And I know um, I've been sent that there's been some questions in the chat about um, uh, how to address some of the state legislative issues um, around payers and insurance uh, problems. And for example, the Department of Government Relations has uh, template letters that they can help you with to send to payers or, uh, or insurance commissioners. And so that's just one example of how they can help you both at the federal and the state level. Um, so please contact um, the DGR uh, and APA. Please get involved. Please help make telehealth um, not just uh, something we do during a pandemic, but ensuring it, ensure telehealth access um, for uh, years ahead. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Batterson. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. And I'm gonna invite Drs. Harris and Shore to uh, get ready for questions. So you all might want to uh, turn on your, your video and be ready to unmute um, when we have a question directed your way, and I'll try to rotate the questions a bit so all of us get a chance to speak. Um, also, for those of you on the live presentation, there have been a few questions that have been put in the Q&A and then answered, but for the sake of those listening, uh, not live, um, but later, um, I'm gonna read some of those questions and, and answers. Um, I'll direct my question at one of the speakers, but the other two may have some comments, so feel free. Uh, discussions are always very interesting. Uh, the first question I'm going to direct is to Dr. Shore. Um, you mentioned that you have two or more monitors or screens, and the person who wrote the question was really curious, what do you use those screens to do? Well, so when I'm, uh, with, uh, when I'm with patients, I'll have the video conferencing app on this uh, main screen. I'll, uh, on the secondary screen, uh, I will have uh, EHR um, or other uh, patient-related data. Um, when I'm uh, video conferencing, uh, the third screen I don't use quite as much, but um, um, I may have other things open there related to the patient care, looking at labs and stuff. Um, so I'm not having to toggle back and forth during the discussion. And then, of course, when I'm doing group and, and business meetings, uh, in terms of documents or PowerPoints. I'm trying to run a Zoom meeting effectively with an agenda and a PowerPoint off of one screen is very uh, complicated. And I uh, have, I mean, I embarrass myself on Zoom all the time, but I'm much more likely to do it when I'm uh, just using one screen. Very good, well, thank you. And do the other presenters have any comments? I use two screens as well for, um similar to Dr. Shore. Um, I have one with that um, my, with the video um, typically and then the patient records above. Um, although sometimes in my, I can get interrupted with IMs 
I can often respond to the IM on my lower screen that's the patient screen. But the patients don't notice it. They actually feel like they have my attention because it's uh, transparent. And then when I have to look up at the screen, I have to say, I'm looking up at your record. Um, in the in physical office, I would turn to the side and look at their record. And, and um, so it's not so different. Um, but I have it up there and I can kind of glance at their labs or write in order. And I, I, as for me, I, I do mostly uh, psychotherapy and I just have one screen. Um, so it, it seems to work for me. <laughs> Good for you. And for another person who only has one screen most of the time, I now feel like I should probably get a second. But um, I do always tell the patient when I'm not looking at them, if I flip to the other screen, I, I like to tell them because occasionally they may misread a, uh, a facial expression of mine or they may do something expecting that I can see them, but I can't. So I always say, I can see, uh, I, I can't see you right now, but uh, you, you can still see me. So uh, not, a, not a bad little uh, tip, by the way, for those of you relatively new to telehealth. Um, the next question uh, I'm going to address first to Dr. Kennedy. It's a question about telehealth advocacy, and um, there were uh, some statements about, you know, what, what some of our priorities might be, and this writer is asking that another priority be to allow um, evaluations to be done via telehealth in addition to in person because the requirement that they be done in person first may limit access. Um, but I know that that can vary. Can you comment on that, Dr. Kennedy? Um, I don't know that I can. Um, I, I think that that is part of uh, the effort, but um, unfortunately, I can't confirm that 100%. But I think the idea is that access would be available um, from the very first um, session. But I, I actually would defer to my other colleagues perhaps um, around whether or not that is actually uh, happening. But in, in terms of the advocacy effort, I, I think that ultimately that probably would be a goal. But again, we're just really trying to make sure that we have audio only um, at least um, and, uh, and be able to have this extend beyond the pandemic. Thank you. Dr. Harris, do you have a comment about that as well? Yeah, um, I, th I think um, two comments. One is um, there's, there's nothing in CPT that prohibits it just um, from that framework. Um, the new patient, a lot of the new patient codes um, can be done, not 100% of them, but um, most of the outpatient e &M codes, for example, the psychiatric evaluation codes. So it's, it's in CPT. Um, I know there's elements of this that are um, federal and elements that are state. So for in Massachusetts, I found out just yesterday that our local Board of Registration and Medicine um, made the decision to take a COVID emergency measure of allowing um, a doctor-patient relationship to be initiated via telehealth. That was a restriction prior, pre-COVID, and it was a relaxation during COVID and they've made it a permanent rule. So, and I think that was based on state advocacy at the uh, Board of Registration. So the board made their own independent um, decision. We're still in a state of emergency, um, but they're, they've made a longer term decision. So I think it's at, at so many levels. And I would just add in terms of uh, the, uh, what Dr. Harris said is spot on that, um, that they're, uh, it's highly variable by state and what the rules and regs about what's permitted. But what we do know from the clinical experience and the research base is that initial exams and assessments can be done with high reliability and high effectiveness uh, via, via telehealth. And we knew that before COVID. Uh, and, and so from the clinical standpoint, it, it certainly uh, can be done. But again, I think the local uh, variable regulations by state are probably the biggest uh, barriers there. 
I wonder if it looks like, <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of telehealth, it looks like <laughs> Dr. Batterson, our, uh, our panelist lead, uh, got booted off. So uh, a little bit of uh, irony, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess I, I can, uh, oh, here he comes back on. I was going to step into the breach, but I will, I will let him continue to moderate. I was going to scroll through the question. <laughs> And as we all experience some technical difficulties, sorry about that. Um, something happened with the internet, and that will will occasionally occur. Um, we have had a few other questions about HIPAA compliant email and HIPAA compliant platforms, and I wonder if. Um, we could maybe have either Dr. Shore, or Dr. Harris talk about those a moment. Do you know which ones are compliant, which ones are not? Um, I, you know, I can't uh, without sort of, uh, re I, I would be worried that I would miss something. I mean, and so you really have to uh, check with if you're an individual, uh, you have to check with whatever platform you're uh, using. Certainly um, uh, an email, for example, right? Also depends, a lot of people use organizational email, how you use it, whether it can be encrypted, the type of communication. For example, in my system, our internal emails don't need to be encrypted because of how the system's set up, but external ones need to. So, um, and the same with video conferencing. In the, just because a platform has encryption on it, it doesn't mean it's being used in a valid HIPAA process as well. And that's a complexity too. It's how it's used in the workflow and other things that you, uh, that you do in terms of your activity and workflow around it. And so, um, so uh, I'd, hard for me to comment on any one technology and even if one is HIPAA uh, has HIPAA encryption or is certified as HIPAA compliant, um, it has to be used in, in, in the correct uh, manner to, to meet those qualifications. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have too, too much to add. Um, I can just talk about a little bit my personal experiences. Um, I've picked a HIPAA compliant platform, which is the main thing I've used with um, patients. Um, and I actually, um, in the course of the pandemic, what I've noticed is there have been some uh, free platforms that are out there and though they have proliferated. Um, so there's, there's one um, free one. Um, I don't find it quite as stable, but I have a backup. And I, so I've created, I've found a platform. I've had some patients struggle with that platform because they have to register for it. And um, so that, that's been a barrier for a few people. Um, I have a secondary one, which just sends a text message. Um, it's HIPAA um, and free. Um, it's the video quality isn't as clear, but it's, I can use it in a pinch and then I fall back to audio only. That's kind of um, having contingencies, I think has been a useful um, thing and, and uh, thinking about it that way. That's, that's how I've uh, done it. But I mean, recommending a particular vendor, I think is so much variability. And I'll, I would just jump in and say, I, I'm using a HIPAA compliant platform, but I have, I, I know colleagues who are not. Um, and so, you know, my recommendation would, would be that uh, you use this time right now to identify a HIPAA compliant platform um, and to start to transition to it um, with your patients so that they start to adapt to whatever uh, tweaks they need to make um, and you become comfortable with it and, and not wait until um, a time at which, you know, HIPAA compliant platforms, you know, are not, not wait till the last minute to do that, but do it gradually um, in a way that, um, you know, makes your patients feel comfortable with that transition. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that makes a lot of this. Now is the time to do it. Another question has come up about, um, what might be the driving forces for either the government or perhaps private insurers? And this is where Dr. Harris, I might direct to you first. 
what might be some of the forces driving private insurers not to want to have telehealth approved? So in terms of advocating with them, I, it might be nice to know their position and why it would not be a good idea. Can you comment on that? Sure, you know, I can. What are they worried I, about? Yeah, I mean, I can try to um, comment on it. I, I think um, every every insurer is different and every employer is, is different. So I think that's the, um, the first uh, thing to think about it and to think about a, a, a culture of, the, of different um, insurers and, and how they frame things. But affordability um, for the purchaser of health, the health insurance is really, really important. And that's different from our patients. And I think that that gets lost in the discussion often when people talk about health insurance. And I'll have to say, I mean, I've been chair of uh, managed care committee and, and, and advocated uh, before I uh, moved to the insurance side of things a couple of years ago. Um, and that's, I think, the thing, if you can keep in mind, what are the employers thinking about? So some employers, are very progressive and some aren't. Um, some health insurance uh, companies are more or less conservative. I would say they're probably all somewhat conservative, um, but there's a, um, a progressiveness about what kind of benefits that are covered. And so telehealth, um, part of the reason I framed the question is, is telehealth a thing? If you think of it as a thing, you create a product, the product, you define a product, you try to sell the product, um, you being the health player, plan is trying to sell a product to an employer who's purchasing the product and they think about telehealth in a particular way. Often that was through these vendor platforms. That's what I noticed in my own plan. There's this sort of concept that the telehealth is the, um, the platform, these um, provider vendor platforms, um, so that the, the provider network is sort of a secondary um, thought in that. And um, so not so much that they're opposed to it, um, but then they're picking and choosing and selling products. And the people at that level in the company who aren't clinical people, um, that's what they're thinking. So I come in as a clinical person, as a psychiatrist, and I'm saying, well, this is what providers and patients need. And people understand that, but that's not what they're thinking when they're dealing with employers and affordability and what the employers are thinking about for their employees. So I, th I think um, thinking about, that's why I had the question and the, the sort of um, cautionary tale, things like telephonic um, codes make um, actuarial type thinkers fearful about affordability, that every telephone call, two minute call, everything's gonna be charged. And I have to say, no doctor wants to document that. That's just insanity. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of what they jump to, um, that every single phone call, every five-minute phone call, and the whole thing will be unaffordable. And not that um, you might get a doctor quickly who can do a 10-minute phone call, and that would prevent a trip to the emergency room, a hospital, a visit, any other thing. They don't make that assumption. They, they look at the worst-case scenario. So I think you know, and, and sometimes the worst case scenario happens. That's what I also have noticed working on the insurance. There's some big frauds out there, but if you let fraud drive things, then good care gets um, lost. And so I think making that reasonable argument, um, you know, that providers are reasonable and are trying to do the right thing. Um, but affordability, affordability, affordability. Um, people are losing their jobs. Um, their um, companies are going out of business or they're trying to figure out how to hold on to their employees and pay the benefits. So that affordability question is going to be huge. And I think there's an argument that can be made about telehealth, but there's also a fear about it ballooning into something that becomes unaffordable. Thanks, Dr. Harris. Um, we have a couple of questions on what happens when a physician might be licensed in a state, but is physically sitting even outside of the United States, but providing telehealth services to people located in the state where they're licensed. Um, does the physical location of the person providing the care impact anything? And I, I don't know if any, either of our, uh, any of our three speakers have any comments or knowledge on this topic, but if you do, 
uh, we've had a couple of questions about that. So the provider of service is located somewhere else. I, my, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I do think that it does make a difference so that I um, would check with your insurer, but I think that your physical location uh, does make a difference just like the patient's phys physical location. And so, for example, um, if you're in uh, outside of the country, your malpractice coverage may not may not cover you. Um, and also, if you know, as we know, if you're in one state and there isn't a licensure agreement with another state, if that if that's where the patient is located, um, that may al also be problematic. But I think I, I think I would check with your insurer to make sure. Dr. You're Shor talking about your malpractice insurer, Dr. Kennedy? Is that what yes. you mean? Yeah. yeah, I was talking about the malpractice insurer, but obviously maybe as well as coding would be um, important as well. And maybe Dr. Harris, you can speak to that. Yeah, I think um, from, I don't know the international question and maybe Dr. Shore, but, um, but I, my understanding is nationally, the, inter, the interstate um, agreements are important, but um, the it, the practice of medicine is following where the patient is, and so as long as you're licensed, if you're in California and you're um, like the physician, you're you're residing in California and you're licensed in Massachusetts, um, I think you can practice medicine in Massachusetts on a patient who's there. Um, we allow that on the insurance, um, but there are there are interstate rules that can um, that can govern and can get complicated. Um, so um, do you have an office in that location? That's often a question um, that gets asked in the insurer. Um, so I think those are two. Uh, I do know physicians who practice out of the country back in the state, you do from the licensing standpoint, you need to be licensed where the patient is. Um, the the other issues brought up about malpractice uh, and every malpractice is different some malpractice companies you call them up and they're like stop calling us we know you travel that's good you don't need to tell us where you're going um, others want to know where your site of practice is when you're seeing the patient and then the billing issue that you bring up particularly out of the country back into the country um, you know that may be a reason for a denial of claim and so if you're working with insurances and unfortunately there's not a guide that's really based on the insurance provider and what they may require about documentation and requirements of your side of practice uh, and so particularly out of the country can be an issue and, and then Dr. Harris it sounds like uh, you've had the experience where wanting to know location and, and that kind of thing and that's more about just um, the billing and reimbursement side. Thank you. And then we've had a couple of um, questions that have had to do with what we predict would be the percentage of the patients that will continue to see by telehealth after the pandemic, and a question about whether commercial insurance will likely continue to cover. Even if we can advocate successfully for CMS to do so, what will the privates do? So maybe we could start with Dr. Harris and then. <laughs> okay. Um, the, so the first question was about what percentage of um, care will be done. Um, I'll just speak for uh, my myself. What, what I've been doing is I, I work, um, I had a full-time uh, solo private practice for 20 plus years and then moved to the health plan and have a very small um, subset of my former practice. And so I have, I sublet space like a lot of people do. And um, what has come to light is um, the people who are kind of running the office may actually not reopen the office at all um, because of the subletting model. So um, I've been telling people I'm going to practice to the end of the year. I don't know when the state of emergency will end. I, there's a lot of uncertainty there, um, but I, I may be faced uh, with not having a place to go back to. Um, so I don't, I, I'm anticipating this is going to be um, how I practice indefinitely for, for a time. And 
Um, I haven't opened that door with the patient, but I, I think there's a lot of question marks for a lot of people. Um, so I'd be curious what others say, but I, 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 th I think there's, um, and I have other colleagues who are anxious to get back. They take care of people with developmental disabilities and they've had a harder time uh, making the transition to, to telehealth. So I think it depends on what your practice looks like. As far as health plans, it's, um, there's a lot of variability in plans. Um, I don't know what will happen. I can't answer that question with certainty, but what was striking to me is um, this is the second year in a row I, intend, I attended the um, annual meeting of America's health plans. Um, and it was amazing the difference from last year to this year. Telehealth and behavioral health, every session was about, we need to do things different for telehealth and behavioral health. It was astounding to me. So I, I think um, the health plans understand the importance, how that translates to every individual plan and what things will look like. I, um, it's hard for me to anticipate, but um, I, was, I was struck um, by how uh, much everyone was beating the drum about telehealth and particularly for um, behavioral health substance use. I can just speak to my solo private practice um, and that I envision having perhaps a hybrid model um, once the pandemic ends. Um, I, I do think that seeing uh, patients in person for psychotherapy is probably optimal, but for many patients um, who either worked long hours um, and could not make it into the office on a regular basis, being, I've been able to see them um, much more frequently, weekly or twice weekly, depending on um, the work. And so I could imagine that for those patients um, where access is increased, uh, even after, after the pandemic ends, we may continue. Um, so I think it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis, but it'll certainly be far more telehealth than I had ever done before, which before the pandemic was zero. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have several more questions, some of which are very specific, and we have just uh, two more minutes left. Um, people have asked about using FaceTime without revealing their identity, and of course, uh, Doximity does have an app that allows you to fairly well cloak your email and phone number, and they also have a, a video link that they're currently offering. Um, so there are many other ways to do that, but FaceTime itself may be difficult. Um, there are some specific questions about federally qualified health centers and what to do about substance abuse patients because not uh, all places are able to do um, all of the substance abuse treatment in terms of medication therapies um, through use of telehealth and checking in with patients in that method. Um, I know that the APA is working hard on these issues, and there was one final question. How do I contact the APA with practice questions focusing on telehealth or other issues? And Dr. Kennedy or Dr. Shore? I would just point out that the APA has a number of resources right there on the website, uh, and there is a, on the telepsychiatry there is the uh, APA, uh, even before COVID, has the telepsychiatry toolkit, uh, which is uh, right, uh, which you put up uh, right on the slides, um, which is uh, a great place to, to begin to look for additional links and resources to telehealth. And then um, there's also the COVID-19 hub that has broader resources as well and links. So those are uh, good places to get uh, started. And certainly for ad advocacy, you can contact the DGR. Um, and I also want to say I've gotten a, a text that many people are already going uh, and writing letters to their Congress people. So please go to psychiatry.org slash telehealth advocacy right after you get off the webinar and send a letter to your Congress people. I'd like to take an opportunity to thank all three of our presenters today, Drs. Kennedy, Harris, and Shore for their time and expertise that they shared. I'd also like to thank APA staff, and I hate to mention people by name for fear of forgetting someone, but Michelle Durst for being the primary coordinator and Kristen Kroger for taking our initial call with concern from Dr. Uh, uh, 
Harris and myself about some concerns uh, over telehealth. So we appreciate everybody's time and energy, and uh, we hope you have a good evening and good luck with your telehealth work.